Welcome to Suffolk Library's Autumn Online Book Festival. We are so incredibly grateful to be able to offer these amazing online events with stunningly talented authors, especially for those of you that don't find it easy to come to our in-person library events so we can still reach you. I'm Lisa, your host, and I am so thrilled that today I'm being joined by best-selling and just obscenely talented author, the amazingly wonderful Jane Fallon. Welcome Jane. Thank you, hello. Oh it's it's such a thrill, I actually love your book so it's so wonderful to finish our festival. Um, lovely Sunday afternoon with yourself. Now you've wanted to write for a long time Jane, I back you know even when you were five years old I believe you were making your own novels, would you tell us about that? I was, I was, I, it was always my dream and uh, because we lived, I think as a lot of people know, we lived above my parents' news agents and there was a little tiny book stand in there. So I used to write little books, um, which were probably about eight pages long, lots of drawing, oh. all about animals, every single one was about animals. So I used to write these little stories and I used to give them to my mum and dad and try and persuade them to sell them in the shop. Absolutely refused, wouldn't do it, wouldn't even. Oh, wouldn't they? <laughs> be like, come on! <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't even put them on there for half an hour and pretend they were doing it but yeah so I used to write all the time and then soon obviously I gave up the actually producing the small books because I realized they were a no-go but I just still used to write all the time and yet for so long you didn't really I don't I don't think you really felt that writing was something you could do as a career you know was the doubts that this is something that you can't we've had that as a theme actually for the office this week saying that they just didn't think that they were somehow allowed to do it how did that change for you when you I know you had this like revelation moment from your first book of how you could write I did I had an epiphany but by that point I was about 46 well I had two small epiphanies I had one when I was about 15 and then one when I was about 46 so when I was young I just I think because when you're young you first of all you read all the little kiddie books and we all kind of read the same thing and then back then there wasn't any YA or anything there wasn't really anything that bridged the gap so you would sort of you'd have the classics and everything which I enjoyed reading but they didn't quite speak to me as I got older uh, they all made me feel as if you had to be from a terribly posh family to be a novelist. I thought you somehow had to be born into this sort of very literary family and uh, that I would be kind of an imposter and, you know, I'd be looked down on if I even tried. So it was never really a serious ambition, even though it was my dream. And then when I was about, and I would still try and write stuff and I never really could find a style. I would overthink everything again, because I was reading classics. So I would think everything had to be terribly highfalutin. And then when I was about 15, I read my first Faye Weldon book, which I found on one of my sister's bookshelves. And that was my first kind of revelation that that was incredible to read something that was so contemporary and was so conversational and relaxed and immediate and funny. Um, that really changed the way I thought about writing but it still, and then, I, well, it still took me until I was like 45, 46. I went off and had a career in TV to try and get it all out of my system. Mm -hmm. I thought I'll still work in stories and drama and fiction. And, blah. and that kind of worked for 20 years. And then when I was about 45, I had a, another revelation um, in the middle of the night. And I was trying to think of an idea for a new TV series. And the idea for getting rid of Matthew came to me. And I just thought if I'm ever going to write a novel, I've got to just let write a novel and show it to anyone this is the story this is the one that really speaks to me this is the one I feel like I can write in a style that works for me and I decided I was just going to give it a go and I love that and you said it's getting rid of Matthew and that book then went went on to get chosen as a world book night book what was that like when you spent you know 40 years going I really want to do this and then you did and then they're giving it out to readers who might in some cases not be able to access books yeah, it was incredible. And I love World Book Night. I love exactly mm. that aspect of it, that they give them away to people that need them. And the World Book Night thing actually, with that book, didn't come to quite a long time after it had been published. I think it was about maybe eight years after or something. It sort of picked it in retrospect. But yeah, it's thrilling to think that it might be an introduction for people into reading generally. And, you know, I love that. I've had a few people say to me with the lockdowns that they lost their mojo for reading. And then one of my books sort of got it back for them and that's such a lovely compliment to have that you've kind of inspired people to read across the board you know to read everything 
Well, we've had several um, questions pop through already. So, Karen, who loves your books, um, especially Worst Idea Ever, it is utterly excellent, Karen. You're absolutely right. Um, besides your own novel, Shane, um, what would you recommend? And I, I feel like we've needed these stories so much in recent times. Definitely. Well, all of this. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, oh, my goodness. I read so much. And actually, because my head's like a sieve and they go in and out of my head immediately and I forget them, I have a little hashtag on Twitter, which is Alan's Fabulous Book Club. Whenever I read a really a book I really love, I put it up on there. Um, so the last few I think that I've loved, there was Magpie by Elizabeth Day that, that was just fantastic. Um, I love all Lisa Jules, finally you should mention her. Um, who are Fiona Neal is one of my favorite novelists. I think she's the way she writes families is just incredible. She gets like messy family dynamics really well. Uh, who else? Oh my God, so many people. Look, Ruth Ware, Louise Candlish, Alice Feeney, all those, Claire McIntosh. Just, um, there are so many amazing writers around now. But yeah, check out my hashtag on Twitter because that's, because I know I'll forget the name immediately. I'll just be going, it, I loved it. I don't know what it's called. Uh, Fallon's Fabulous Book Club and all my book recommendations go on there. And I only, I genuinely only put on ones that I've absolutely loved. That's brilliant. We've had another question as well from uh, Simona, who's also loves your books, but she's a bit like what you were saying. She started out writing and she's asked, what do you wish you'd known beforehand? Oh, I think the main thing, you know, is I wish I'd known that people wouldn't be judging me. I mean, they would be judging me, obviously, when I first sent it out, but it, they wouldn't be judging me in a terrible way. They wouldn't be passing it around an office and saying, look at this load of old tripe. I was so scared to show anyone any of the fiction that I'd written that I never sent anything out. I just, I was so terrified, not of rejection because I knew there'd be rejection. I was terrified of sort of being caught out or of people, you know, someone sending a letter back going, you are absolutely rubbish. Why are you even trying to do this? So I think there's that. Just have confidence in yourself. Don't worry about what other people are gonna think about what you write, just write what you want to write. Um, and similarly, don't be self-conscious about it. It's not, you know, if you make it into a big deal, giving someone something to read of yours, it will become a big deal. So it doesn't need to be a big deal. You can just, I just heard my cat meow. <laughs> um, yeah, just, uh, you know, it's not, if they, someone reads something you write and they don't like it, it doesn't matter. Oh, I love this. Um, I'm sure a lot of people watching live and catching up is a Pickle fan. How could we not be, Miss uh, Pickle? Oh, there she is, hold on. This is a pickle. Oh my goodness. And a year with you. I mean, God, she's living the life, isn't she? I can't believe we've had her a year. It was a year on Monday. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's flown by. Oh my goodness, so much. But yeah, she's an absolute bundle of joy. Well, Kathy said, woohoo, Pickle is making an appearance. I totally agree. And, you know, I think you've always been a big, well, now we've had Pickle into, interlude, we, I think you've always been a big fan of animals and I am too, I can't go anywhere without making friends with cats, dogs, you know, last holiday, baby squirrel. And um, it's, I know it was amazing. It was just the most extraordinary moment. And I know you said before, like, you know, a home's not really a home without a little fluffy animal. I totally feel like that. I mean, I grew up with, we got a cat and a dog on the same day when I was three. Um, and we had them all the time until I left home, after I left home. And uh, we've always had cats and it, I feel exactly like that. I feel there's just a hole in the heart of your house if there's no animal there. Uh, so yeah, and it, I, you know, it could be anything. I don't care what kind of animal it is as long as it wants to be loved by me and it's happy for me to sort of annoy it all the time. Oh, and when uh, Jane said a moment ago about finding her favourite reads on Twitter, do remember those that haven't already, obviously her latest book, Worst Idea Ever, get it hashtag, hashtag promo pets, um, get all those gorgeous little animals that we've got at home and share them with Jane and everyone on Twitter, that would be utterly amazing. And your, your current book, Jane, I think was the original idea, the inspiration, was something that in a way wasn't very good that happened on Twitter. So some of your bit of trolling that was going on and you have totally turned it around, which I think is amazing, into creating yeah. this fantastic book. I often write about things that, issues that are slightly preoccupying me at any point. And this was, um, I always keep my social media a really happy place. I'm not on there to argue with people. I don't care if someone, it, I've never met and I'm never going to meet doesn't agree with me I'm not going to bother arguing with them I just mute them because who cares um 
especially if they're being mean. So if anyone's even slightly mean, I just mute them immediately. And I don't get many of those people. But what had happened was that someone was trolling quite a few of my followers. Um, so, you know, my followers would say, one of my followers would say something and I'd reply to it, they get this stream of kind of horribleness. And then all these other people joined in. And actually after a while, it became obvious that it was all the same person because the syntax was the same, the um, grammar was the same, everything, you know, you could tell by little ticks how much people try and disguise themselves. I should be a detective. Um, you could tell- Oh, that would be good but, fun, wouldn't it? Uh, but it did really make me think, it made me think, you have no idea who you're talking to. And not only that, it could be someone you know, and it, you know, it could be someone you know from another profile, it could be someone you know in real life, it could be literally anybody you're talking to and you just have no idea. And obviously you explore this in your new book. Was that a lot of fun? You've got those, those main uh, characters who have got like this friendship, this sisterly friendship. And you know, what turns, what initially was meaning well, um, turns to like catastrophe. Yeah, exactly. So George and Lydia have been friends since they met at art college and now kind of 20 odd years later, um, George is very successful. She's a ch children's illustrator and author. And Lydia has had no success with her art at all. And she's doing a job that she hates. And she decides to set up an online shop just to try and showcase some of her art, just to try and get a bit of feedback. And she gets no attention, really. So Georgia, as you say, absolutely from a good place, sets up a yeah. fake Twitter account to kind of pose as a customer, but more to send her compliments, you know, to say, I really love your stuff, just to give her a bit of an ego boost. And it all kind of starts to go wrong when Lydia starts to befriend this stranger that she's met on Twitter, which she doesn't know is Georgia, um, and starts to confide in her. And then she starts to confide in her things about her friendship with Georgia, which Georgia doesn't know. And also to say, eventually, that she knows something about Georgia's life that Georgia doesn't know that would kind of blow her life apart. And so obviously Georgia has to stick in, you know, you can't then leave that situation and not find out what it is. So she has to stick in there pretending to be this other person trying to find out what it is that Lydia's talking about. And I love that in the book, obviously, where James explained that you've got Georgia who's having this conversation with Lydia, not being herself, this fake account, while being friends with her in real life and like obviously desperately wanting to say, what was that message about? And not being able to, because then she sort of outs, outs herself then, doesn't she? So she ended up sort of digging her own grave there where she puts herself in, backs herself into this corner where she can't bluntly ask her friend, what the heck did you mean? Yeah, exactly. So the only way she can find out is to stick with this fake persona. And the intention had only ever been, you know, to go in and go out, be there for a couple of weeks saying nice things and then gradually sort of tail off and that would be it. But she's completely stuck in there. So obviously I can't say too much, but uh, it all turns horribly messy. Very messy. And I think that, you know, you, you have a tendency to use sort of real life, you know, you've had women measuring your office to make sure it's not too big and, you know, your friend's stories. And I think now your friend's friend's stories because they're a bit nervous about ending up in one of your books. Um, do you really, is that something that really fascinates you about human nature and these relationships? Because you explore it so brilliantly in your books. Totally. I think there's nothing more fascinating than the things we do to people we're supposed to love or care for. Um, you know, that are sometimes much, much worse than the things you would do to a total stranger. Um, so, yeah, I love all those kind of themes of jealousy and revenge and, um, you know, hidden sort of undercurrents that go on in friendships or in work relationships or in marriages or whatever. That's that's just joyful to me to get in there. And you mentioned about Lisa Jewell being a, you're a fan of her work, and I know she's a big people watcher um, and I think you are like you like to hang out in coffee shops and, and go what's that saying write a little note that'll make a great book yeah I do I'm horribly nosy I do I just because I've even before I was kind of using some of it as material I just always like to talk to people about that kind of stuff you know so even if I'm having my hair cut or whatever I'll we'll end up having this really deep conversation about some terrible trauma that the hairdresser's in with someone they know or something because it, yeah it's just it's drama isn't it it's absolute mm. drama and fascinating have you found like in your you know you're on your 11th book now do you have moments where you go oh do you know there was that conversation I had do you find them coming back when you because I think initially you look at the character um yeah. situation like the relationship yeah. you want to explore exactly. and then you bring in the theme so when you're looking at the theme do you sort of have a little flashbacks and going oh do you know there was that place yeah, there's sometimes a bit of that. Maybe I think my memory's maybe not as good as it should be. But yeah, I absolutely always come from the situation. So 
it'll be do I you know my do I want to write about siblings or friends or a couple or colleagues or you know whatever I'll find that sort of dynamic that I'm interested in and then I try and think about the worst thing I could put in the way of that particular type of relationship um, and then I was I spend about three months trying to think through the idea and really work it through and really get to the bottom of how messy it can be before I'm satisfied and I'll then move on and start writing because I think for me the, that's the really important part that I've explored every avenue and that I know there are enough twists and turns I can get out of it and there's enough sort of meat in there and also stuff that I'll enjoy writing about so like I really enjoyed writing all that Twitter stuff because I had a lot of stuff on my mind about it um you know the next book which I'm not allowed yet to say what it's oh. called I'm just meant to be doing an announcement any minute now um but it goes into the world of online dating and mm. I've got a couple of friends who've been doing it for the past couple of years and every time I speak to them I'm like okay tell me they're lining up their stories to tell me and it's fascinating and I've been thinking about it a lot so I've really enjoyed kind of immersing myself in that world and obviously the book um worst idea ever and you had like this awesome competition on twitter recently for people to tell you their you know their worst ideas and one of them was about getting their hair permed which um i really felt because once i got my hair cut really short dyed it blonde and permed it, it i can't even begin to say my friends have photos they promise they won't share them so <laughs> because there was a very similar one to that as well as the one <laughs> yeah <laughs> The things we do like what is there anything that springs to mind for you Jane like you had moments where you think god you know I probably should have done that well funnily enough the, the thing one of the reasons that I picked that as one of the winners that that hair one was because that is one of mine that once my boyfriend persuaded me it was in the 80s and uh, I don't know if anyone remembers the Thompson twins but she had kind of big wild hair and I had big crazy corkscrew curly hair and he persuaded me to have it cut razor cut up the side here just up one side and the idea was that it would look like it was all kind of swept over one side all the time. I just look, I don't know what I look like. I look like, and I had it dyed blonde at the time. So I looked like some kind of half finished topiary poodle. It was just horrendous. I should have, now I'm thinking, why did I not just buzz up the other side and have a Mohican? But anyway, um, so for months, it just looked awful. So for months I would plait this side that had hair and this side was sort of growing out like a little bush and I would have to just keep flattening it because it was really curly whirly coming out. So yeah, that was definitely one of my worst. Don't let anyone tell you what to do with your hair. It's one of those things, isn't it? Women, it's often these horrific hair stories of like, what were we thinking? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's nice to sort of make that big change. And one of the things I also want to talk to you about is Queen Bee, your last book before this one, it was chosen for a Rich and Judy book club pick. Now, I'm, I'm unfortunate to several of the authors you just mentioned, like yourself, brilliant writers who've all had that honour. What was that like? You know, again, someone that had wanted to write for so long and then propelled into the, the wonderment of Richard and Judy. It was amazing. Well, actually, because Getting Rid of Matthew was actually chosen for it as well when it came out. So it, I think it came out in the January and it was chosen for Richard and Judy in about the, I can't remember now, it was so long ago, June or July. And that was unbelievable because, you know, my first book, that was just incredible. And that was when Richard and Judy had their TV show and it was a huge deal and actually I never really thought I'd get it again so to get it again last year it was fantastic that's a great I love all those little book clubs and with them I know that they genuinely do read the books and they genuinely do pick them themselves um so yeah it's a real honor and obviously it gives you a nice boost and everything and and as you said like 11 books in and asked um he's not able to join us live so asked out of your own novels Jane do you have a favorite do you know what? It changes all the time. Whenever people ask me this, I'm, I'm liking a different one more. At the moment, I'm really into My Sweet Revenge for some reason. Not that I've reread it or anything, but I've just been thinking about the story. And uh, yeah, I really like that one. I really like Strictly Between Us. All of them I like at different times for different reasons. So it's hard to pick out a favourite. And yeah, I think it is. She's asked a few authors about that, and it's it's quite a tough one. And Laura, who loves your book covers and, and your books, and I agree, they're really catching and like really great titles. Um, so do you get any input in that as the author to kind of come up with that? Well, not to come up with it. I always thought that I'd be brilliant at book covers. I don't know why. I just thought I'd be brilliant. Um, and I realised very early on that I'm absolutely useless. And I know what I don't like, but I have no ideas at all about covers. And uh, thankfully, the team at Michael Joseph at Penguin are just incredible. So 
they're brilliant in that they will always let me have input. They would never, um, you know, come up with a cover that, and just go, this is the cover, you're having it, whatever. They'll, they'll come up with ideas and they'll show them to me and we'll all talk about them. But they come up with things that I would never even imagine. And they've been great that they've sort of moved them on all the time. And also they've avoided a lot of the cliches, which I really like. So I feel like they've come up with some great, really original ideas for my covers. And the titles as well, they're so snappy and like really they, they encapsulate the book that you're about to read. Do you have that when you're writing as like a working title? Sometimes some of them I did, but uh, Getting Rid of Matthew, Got You Back and Foursome, the first three, I absolutely 100% knew what the title should be as soon as I started. And ever since then, it's been much more hit and miss. Um, so now I'm more sort of, I guess, more collaborative. I need more input from my editor and we talk about it and we send each other endless, like you should see our emails, just lists of ridiculous, you know, phrases or half phrases or words here and there. Um, so we go back and forth and back and forth and uh, we kind of come up with it together now. I've never had, unfortunately, it was so clear to me in those first few what the title should be and I've never had that since. Um, but yeah, it's a kind of long process. And also sometimes book, my books go through several different titles before we get to the one that we decide we're going to stick with. Um, because also we're always trying to, I'm always trying to come up with a title as I'm writing the first draft. And as you're writing the first draft, the book changes completely. Like the emphasis, even though I've planned, you know, I've done a synopsis, the emphasis, emphases will change. Um, and so the title kind of has to change as well. So it's a very fluid process, but yeah, it's very, very collaborative with Penguin. And I think um, you touched upon it already um, during the interview that you are a big planner. Before you even put pen to paper, you spend several months working out the book. Is that like a sort of sat nav guiding star for you when you then start writing? And you ever have moments where you're like, I'm not sure where it's going. And you're like, this is the plan. Yeah, it's exactly that. So I don't do a chapter breakdown. I'm not sadly not that organized. Um, but I do quite a detailed synopsis, you know, maybe four or five pages. And what it will always have is the big terms in it. So part of my synopsis will say something happens. That means this. I won't have worked out what the something is yet, but I'll know what I want the effect to be. Um, and then when I start writing, I don't really look at that again until, like you say, I'll get to a point somewhere in the middle of the book and I'll think, what am I meant to be writing about? Or I'm sure I had like more of a theme or an overarching idea. And then I'll go back to it and it's really helpful. So and the end will always change. The end will never be the ending I've written in my planning because you've gone off at such a like massive tangent all over the place. But it's really comforting to know that I've got that document there if ever I need it. You know, it's like a little sort of comfort blanket that I've got hidden away on my computer and I can refer to if I need it. But otherwise I just kind of let the book take me where it takes me. Because you do find once you're writing things change massively and characters sounds so pretentious characters don't behave like you thought they would behave because mm. once you've written them and written them and written them they're not that person you had in the synopsis you know you've given them character traits and everything that mean they wouldn't make that choice that you thought they would have so you have to adapt to what you're writing obviously to fit in with the people that you've written if that makes absolutely sense. it's like you breathe life into them isn't it instead of just being a name on a page and like a, a brief outline of who they are they become real flesh and blood and I really love that about your books like the characters they're so relatable and they feel so incredibly real and I like that conversational style that you have with writing you just it almost feels like we're listening in at a coffee shop and going oh my god you did what I love that <laughs> And do you find that, like from what you just said, that these characters, oh, I've got a little pickle tail in the background of your screen. It's lovely, Jane. Um, so gorgeous. Usually when I sit on this chair, she'll come up. Oh. Anyway. Oh, <laughs> shy. Yeah. It's fine to have cat interludes. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you find that yourself, that they do misbehave as such a bit? And, and because they've become a different person, you're starting to... We had, I had one author and he's like, I, I put my character and you went, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly it. it's like, because suddenly they're not... You think, well, that person would never do that. You know, if you met that person in real life, they would never behave in that way. And I think where people sometimes fail or they get themselves into a cul-de-sac is when they continue to try and force their characters into doing yeah. what they pre-planned for them whether or not it feels real and I think what you have to do like I say is you have to adapt the story to have them make choices that they would really make um, you know and which will take your story off at a completely different angle you have to revise the kind of whole storyline that's why I, lo I love that stage and I love that you do that and then you have to think through 
okay, so now they're going to do this. And what's every ramification there could be of them doing that? What's every single thing I can think of that might come out of that? And then you have to explore all those avenues and so much fun, all that. It does sound like so much fun. And um, we've got a question from Charmaine as well, who's um, around your writing. And she's, um, when looking for a new story to tell, do you know what narration you're going to use, Jane? And they've said, I feel that it's the most difficult thing to make work every time and stick with that same one for safety. I usually know, well, some of mine have been third person, probably half and half, third person and first person, my books. Um, I usually know who I want the main narration to be, but quite often with mine, they'll have a dual, dual narrator and I don't always know who that's gonna be or if I'm gonna do that or not. Um, sometimes, you know, halfway through, I think, oh, actually this would be great if we could hear the other person's perspective and I'll bring in the new person then. So yeah, and also I've had books where I've started, I've definitely had books where I've started first person with one of my characters narrating and then quite a long way in I've decided this isn't working and I've gone I've rewritten the whole thing as third person or vice versa so yeah it's not always completely easy but I've usually I usually know who I've usually got one character that I want at least the focus of the story to be on whether they're narrating or not and I think because you start before you start writing you decide what character relationship that is again that's kind of like the cornerstone isn't it that you can go back to and we I mean we've touched upon this already but Rachel uh, near the beginning of the interview uh, said Hi, Jane. She loves your book, Comfy. Um, and she loves you. You're awesome. And she said about asking advice when writing. And one of the things that just came through then that you've already talked about is, re I feel like not boxing yourself into a corner. You can rewrite it, you, you know, and having faith. Is that the kind of thing that you would advise, you know, like Rachel, who's a budding writer? Yeah, no, I definitely would. Um, I always say to people, just unless you think it's an absolute disaster, try and get through your first draft. Even if halfway through the first draft, you realize you've got to change the story completely, do that, keep on going, keep moving forward with all your changes. So now it's almost like a book of two complete halves and the first half doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't matter. Don't just keep going back and rewriting the beginning. Get to the end of something because by the end of that rough first draft, you'll know your characters so well, like that a rewrite is really easy and you'll know what's worked in the story and what hasn't, you know, all of that stuff. Also the for me, the psychological uh, uplift from finishing a first draft, even if it's absolutely dreadful, is incredible. Like it's so much easier. You, you relax and you think, all right, I've written 100,000 words of utter nonsense, but I can go back now. I've learned so much in that process that I can go back and I can start again and I can rebuild it and everything. So yeah, I think that's the thing. Don't keep rewriting everything, just keep plowing forward. And if, but if the story's not working, do 180 swerve on the story, but just keep moving forward and keep going because you can always rewrite everything. You know, you have months that you can rewrite stuff. Even once you've handed it in, you can rewrite and rewrite and rewrite for months. I think that's awesome advice. And obviously Rachel touched upon this desire. It's like perfection problem, isn't it? Where it's like, I've got to keep going over that same sentence or chapter. And then you spend 10 years and you've not finished it. Um, as you say, you can always shine it and make it. Um, one lovely author where our children's book festival is like, we make it shinier. But you, you've got to have something to make shinier to begin right. with, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think I'm kind of lucky in having come from TV and having started as a script editor, I'm used to polishing things. I think some people find the editing process a bit more daunting. I actually love it. I love, I've just sent my first draft in for my new one. And once I know that they like it, obviously that's the scary bit. Um, but then I love getting notes and going back in and taking it all apart and putting it all back together again. It feel, I, I love this really exciting process, I think. And I think if you can learn to enjoy that and not be scared of it, that's incredibly helpful. You know, it's not that daunting. Keep the original version. If you mess it up by editing it and you make a mess of it, then just throw that one away and go back to the original and start again. It's like, you haven't lost anything. And I, I, I actually find it quite comforting for those, and we often get people asking for writing advice, that yourself, Jane, best-selling author, and other best-selling authors I've interviewed have all said, when they hit that send button, they just think, oh my God, you know, what are they gonna think? Is it any good? And it's, it's good for us to remind us that, you know, even when we admire, um authors like yourself so much that we're still all people aren't we um we still all have our fears and our doubts and that's absolutely normal it's almost like accepting that as part of the process instead of letting it stop you yeah exactly it's terrifying when you send it in 
absolutely terrifying. I feel sick all week and you'd, I keep refreshing my email thinking, am I going to get something? Luckily, I've had something from my editor saying, just to let you know, I'm loving it so far. I'm like, I can breathe because you don't know. I can breathe now. Yeah, but you know, I've been immersed in it for now. I, I can write a, a first draft in about six months. It used to take me longer. but And then the three months before that, thinking of the story. And I haven't, it's just been me up to that point, usually. Occasionally, if I'm really stuck, I'll send something in early. But I actually feel like, I'm much better with tunnel vision. I feel like I'm much better if I just keep my head down and keep doing it. And then someone else comes in at the end and says, hold on a minute. Um, so I don't know what I've written by the time I send it in. You know, I don't. I think I do, but I don't know if it's any good or not. So yeah, it's really scary. And it's, it's almost feel prepared and do it anyway. Mm. Um, like just to take, but take that on and think, you know, this is what I want to do with my life. I'm going to take the plunge and send it in. We've got a question. Um, Olivia has said hi. She loves your books. Thank you for your books. They're absolutely magical. They do take you on a great journey. Um, I did read your, your latest book, Jane, in the day. I can put it oh, down. Really? My husband was next to me and I'm like, no, busy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, she wanted Olivia to ask about um, your books being translated into more languages and you know that she'd loved Milano they're only available to buy in English and she'd love to recommend to her husband's family but they aren't always like available in the language that they need are there any plans for that because obviously it, there's lots of rights involved and yeah, they're all in this is my um I don't know if you can see where the picture is and above that's my foreign language shop so they're all I think I'm in something like 22 23 different languages um some of them all of them and some of them some of them so most of them are in well they're all in at least 20 odd languages I would say um so hopefully fingers crossed unless you speak a very obscure language hopefully you can find them in something um that you would read so yeah and obviously they keep and what's great is if they if a country discovers one, like I've just sold them all to I think Estonia, but they'll they'll pick up one and then they'll go back and pick up the others, which is great. So then you know hopefully the people there will get a kind of whole backlog of books in their language. That's fantastic. And I know we've, we've also touched upon your writing. You like to plot before you start, but I think you also like choir. Um, that's like your only thing you want choir. Does that mean that you'll write anywhere though? but or do you like is there a certain space that you would let this pickle need to be there looking gorgeous you know just well, I imagine she makes everything better yeah, she makes everything better um she does but she's also a distraction obviously because oh yeah keep looking at her. Um, lying on the space. keyboard probably yeah. and mm. uh no I work all over the house and I can work you know I've done I've worked in cafes I'm really good at working in hotel rooms I really like working in hotel rooms um on planes is I find really good it's like about the mm. air on planes that's kind of does something to you for me, as long as it doesn't even have to be like I can sit in the cafe and everyone else can be talking away as long as they're not talking to me. So I can't have noise that's directed at me. And if I'm at home, I don't want to hear any music like traffic and stuff outside doesn't bother me. But music, anything like that, TV, nothing that that's all really distracting. But mostly it's people talking to me, being talked to because I'm I, I walk around the house doing stuff. But all, every, all that's ticking over in my head is a problem that I've got in the plot. And if mm. someone interrupts it, then it's like, oh, I've got to start again. At <laughs> <laughs> the very beginning of that problem and start again. So um, that's kind of what I mean by quiet. So I, I, this is my office that I'm in now. So I sit in here, which is lovely. Um, and Pickle would always sit in here with me, which is nice, quite often on the desk. Um, or I sit downstairs in the living room if I'm in on my own. But obviously if we're if anyone else is in, then I can't do that because I'm like, shut up, shut up. Just. <laughs> I need quiet and I think you usually write around a thousand words a day but um, what often happens and authors talk about is those moments when you think it's not coming mm -hmm. you know you have those magical days where you're like typing away and it's just pouring out and then you have days and you're like oh, I have no idea what's right and I think uh, do you still go for a run at those moments Jane and sort of like shake it out and then come back I go a for a run yeah run is good when I'm stuck on a plot point that's really good but I tend to do my all my actual writing really early in the morning because I get up I think as a lot of people know stupidly uh, look at the bags under my eyes I get up stupidly early you know um, and that's when my brain works properly but uh so what I find sometimes I do have days where I then I'm my brain is just mush and nothing's coming out or where I know what I'm writing isn't very good and I have two ways of dealing with that really one is that I, if I sort of know where I need to be next in the book, so I kind of know where I'm going, but what I'm writing at this point is very uninspiring. 
if I'm having a bad day, I would just think I'm just going to plod on in that direction. It can be the most boring, awful, turgid, uninspiring writing because I can go back and edit it. But I'll just get to that next point and then I'll be inspired and then I'll pick up again and, you know, I'll go back and revise that later. So that's quite a useful way of thinking about it. Don't think that everything you write has to be perfect at the time, like we said. You know, and if you feel uninspired, just try and get to the next bit of the story that you're excited about or the next character development that you're excited about. And then you'll you'll pick up again and it'll all be much more fun. So I either do that or then odd days, if my brain really isn't working at all, I'll read back through what I've written. But I try not to do that too often because it's easy to just keep reworking sort of chapters one to chapter 10 because that's the bit you keep going back you know, you're like, work that, work that, work that, and then you've done your couple of hours and then you stop. So I try and dip in, I'll dip in randomly. So I'll think, oh, I'll start today, I'll read chapter 26. And I just dive in and, so I don't think about it in the context of the plot or the story because I don't really know, can't remember what's happened for exactly, you know, at that stage. But I look at it as like an entity in itself and think, is this chapter entertaining? Are the characters working? Are, do they feel like them? It's quite a nice exercise to do, you know, to try and look at it completely objectively. And that's a good one to do when your brain's not working very well. And, and also gives you the feeling that you're still moving it along, aren't you? Yeah, that you me, can I come at it I'm different ways. Yeah, absolutely. I need to feel like I'm progressing every day, whatever way it's in. Otherwise, I've had periods before where if I just do nothing and I think I'm not going to work today, then I'll get in a bit of a spiral of that. And then I get into a panic. Um, so I'd rather do something every day. I feel comforted if I do something every day. So, you know, like I say, if that's all it is, that's fine. It's something that's going to help the book in the end. And do you think like that you will always write now for the rest of your life? Like, because some people are like, when can I retire? Oh, but yeah. so many authors I've spoken to are like, I'm never going to stop. You know, they're going to be like, get me out of the coffin. I'm, go I'm still going. Definitely. I'm never going to stop. I mean, the fact that I was writing for sort of 35 years, no, more than that, 40 years before I got published um, all the time. I'm never going to, yeah. I mean, I would be writing whether I was getting them published or not. And even more so now that I've had some published and I, and now, you know, I've had the sort of joy of actually finishing a novel because that for the first 40 years, that wasn't happening. I was writing and then abandoning stuff. Um, I can't imagine ever stopping. I find it's, I love immersing myself in that fake world that I've created. And I find it, even when it's kind of stressful, which it often is, I find it sort of relaxing, just creating a world and being in it. I love that. And you, you've already touched upon, obviously, before you wrote, you kind of, which, again, a lot of writers have previously been journalists, or they've kind of got or, um, actors where they've written, so they found a way to kind of bring writing in without going straight at the target. And, and you did something similar, you know, similar thing, you were a script editor, you know, you worked with EastEnders, you also, which I, I really have to tell you, you worked with the producer on one of my all-time favourite ever shows, um, This Life, um, the BBC show, which was a really Original, refreshing, edgy, you know, absolutely stunningly good. You know, I remember me and all my friends were like, leave the pub, last episode. Yeah. Yeah. Get, well, it was a big group of us watching that last episode of it. And you've said before about that, that time period being quite a big achievement for you. You know, do you look back on those days fondly? Oh, yeah, I do. I mean, I have no desire to go back into TV, but it was amazing. Um, and I really lucked out, like, when I was leaving... So I'd been at EastEnders, I'd done a few other shows as a script editor and I'd gone to EastEnders as the series, I think it was either called the series script editor or the story editor. So I was like looking after all the storylines and stuff. And then I was made one of the producers, obviously a soap has many producers. So it's a sort of halfway house. It's almost like being an assistant producer because you're not worrying about the schedule or the budget. You're just looking after your little batch of episodes creatively. And when I decided to leave there, I knew I wanted to do something original. I didn't want to go and work on one of the shows that already existed. And I thought I, I, I had some ideas of my own and I thought, who should I send them to? And uh, there was a producer, a sort of veteran producer, even then called Tony Garnett, who'd, he had done things in the sixties, which I was, even I was too young to remember, um, like cares, like amazing things, social commentary, dramas and stuff. And then he'd recently, done a series called Cardiac Arrest, uh, which was a thing set in a hospital, which was amazing. And I thought, uh, you know, I just knew, he seemed to be incredible. So I thought I'll just send him my ideas, just out of the blue, I'd never met him. And I sent him my ideas and I got a letter back saying, um, I'll come in and meet. So I went in to meet him and we talked about my ideas and ultimately none of them were things that he felt like he wanted to run with. But then a couple of weeks later, he called me and said, um, would you be interested? I've got this new series that we're trying to set up. 
for the BBC and it's about sort of young lawyers and they're all like in their thirties and I want someone young to run it. He said, cause I feel like I don't relate to those people. He was, I guess in his sixties then. Um, so I want to hand it over basically to someone of that kind of age. And he, I mean, I had, you know, my experience was minimal really then. And he basically just said, just do whatever you want with it. I'm here in the background if you ever need help, but I'm not going to interfere in any kind of way. So you just, you know, get on with it. He encouraged me because we have no money, he encouraged me to hire a team of other young, fairly inexperienced people. And I was just incredibly lucky that he gave me that opportunity because that kind of started everything for me, really. So the timing of that was just incredible for me. And just spectacular. And obviously, Andrew Lincoln, look at him now, you know, he yeah. kickstarted his career, his yeah. first major role. Um, Catherine, before the event, you've kind of touched upon this a little bit, One said she loves your books and she wants to know when the next one is out. Now, I know you said you can't really tell us about it, but can you, have you, you know, do you know yet a pub date? I do. It's going to, well, not again, not a definite one, not allowed to say, uh, but it will be next spring, uh, probably late spring. Um, I'm got, I'm, I've got an announcement I'm going to do in a couple of weeks about it. But yeah, that's the kind of time that we're looking at. And um, Rachel's also said about your, which I'm just going to mention because it is an awesome cushion. There's a black cushion in the background. Is that all dogs matter? No, um, no, it's not. It's not actually. It's um, that was a publication present for Queen Bee from my publishers. Isn't it lovely? It's a, it is a dog. It is indeed a dog. Um, but yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? No, it's not all dogs matter, but they are a brilliant charity. If any of you are looking for a brilliant charity, them and feline friends are the ones that uh, sorted out pickle from her. Oh, and, and you've um, was we've, we've touched upon the lovely pickle spent a year with you. You've got your love bomb after like lunchtime our, our cat I has when like I first came onto this my face was creased from where I've been lying down on my side doing the love bomb with her <laughs> lying in my face um we recently got a gorgeous little Bengal rescue cat and he likes um, we, I joke I say wolf pack together wolf pack so every morning he, he isn't settled until we're all in a room with him and, and we just have like a little it can only sometimes only a few minutes but unless we do that he's wandering around meowing trying to herd us yeah, all together they just love a routine don't they um elizabeth has, has said that um that it's amazing your talent was recognized even then with this life and i think that's the case like utterly brilliant brilliant books and latest worst idea ever when you get to part two like you know and I've already been talking to Jane before we started that I, I can't say live because my screen's going funny for my apologies I can't say because it's a spoiler the ending is utterly brilliant it's I, I the book read it in a day husband yeah busy um totally engrossing it's about friendship deception social media what could, you know, I love this about authors. It's like, what if? And then, you know, apparently quite a lot can go wrong. So do check it out in a moment because we've run out of time. Um, you're going to be directed to our website. You can pick up uh, your very own copy of Jane's book, which I highly recommend. If you haven't yet, read everything she's ever written. Um, as you've just heard, a new book coming out not that long. Internet dating, that could be, I can't imagine what could what that's going to be going with those characters that, um, you know, Jane has this great talent to just breathe life into. Um, thank you, everybody that's joined us live. I know a lot, I said a lot of people catch up on our YouTube channel. Welcome. Um, we are a charity, Suffolk Libraries, and we love the support that we receive from our customers and authors. It means the world to us. And Jane, I'm totally thrilled to have been able to chat to you this afternoon and get to see Pickle. Um, it's been oh, wonderful. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. I love that. And thank you so much, everyone, for watching and everything. That was really good fun.